Hello and welcome to Generation 16, the series that showcases the history of Sega's Mega Drive. I'm your host, Greg Seward. Along with the pack-in title Pyramid Patrol, there were two other Mega LD games released alongside the Pioneer Laser Active on launch day. Strangely enough, two of them were pyramid-based. Unlike Pyramid Patrol, the Great Pyramid is not about unexplained structures found on Mars or the return of an ancient civilization bent on destruction. Instead, The Great Pyramid is the first educational title released for the format. Ancient Egypt, the cradle of civilization. Seriously though, this is not a game. It's more like something you were likely to see when your middle school history the teacher wheeled the, the TV night. cart into the classroom one day. Monuments. Featuring a couple Jesus hours of documentary of footage recorded at multiple ancient Egyptian sites, as well as a few shots from modern cities and museums. But this isn't a linear experience. While selecting the main option from the top menu will treat you to a high-level overview of what to expect from the disc, the real meat of the experience is hidden in the other menu options. The rest of the content is divided up into a few different categories. By digging into the menu options and selecting Pharaoh, you can search through information about 11 different rulers of ancient Egypt, like Cheops, Tutankhamun, Cleopatra, and Akhenaten, their history, accomplishments, and impact. By selecting the pyramid menu option, you'll learn theories about how pyramids were built, which I have to say is pretty amazing. The history and evolution of Egyptian pyramid construction, and of course, a focus on the Great Pyramid at Giza. The exploration of this pyramid, built for King Khufu, includes a room-by-room -room tour of the interior as well as information about the surrounding pyramids, temples, and the Sphinx. The mystery section focuses on the act of excavating ancient Egypt, what we know and don't know about the civilization, as well as delves into more interesting and, dare I say, fantastical theories about things like the height of the Great Pyramid and its relation to the distance between the Earth and the Sun, uh, the fact that the four corners of the Great Pyramid point to the four cardinal directions of the compass, and so on. This area of the disc also touches upon the existence of an unknown space, an undiscovered chamber believed to exist within the Great Pyramid based on electronic image scanning of the structure. It details failed efforts by a French team of archaeologists to prove the existence of the space using fiber cameras. In the decades since, many researchers have become convinced that there are more chambers in the Great Pyramid than are currently known. Further scans have identified two voids. As of this recording, one team of Japanese researchers is planning to bombard the pyramid with cosmic rays to confirm the existence of these chambers. This would have already happened in 2020 had it not been delayed due to the coronavirus outbreak. The lead researcher on the project is Sakuji Yoshimura, who also happens to be credited as the supervisor of this laser active disc. Professor Yoshimura has been a major part of Japanese Egyptology since being a part of a team of students from Waseda University that arrived in Egypt in 1966. He was a member of the first ever Asian team granted the right to excavate by the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities in 1971. When his mentor, Professor Kawamura, died, suddenly at the age of 48, Yoshimura pledged to never give up his excavation until the day he died. And it seems he's kept his word. I believe we see Mr. Yoshimura in this short clip on the disc itself. Along with his decades-long body of work, which includes being involved in the discovery of the royal tomb of Amenhotep III, the colored staircase at Kam al Samak, and 200 mummies in a private tomb at Sheikh al Dalkurna, Sakuji Yoshimura has long been a vocal booster for Japanese Egyptology, keeping it in the public eye with a focus on what the Japanese can bring to the field. Yoshimura and other Japanese Egyptologists were early adopters of using technology in the region. 
things like using a CT scan to restore the features of a mummy in the early 80s, and ground-penetrating radar to survey the Great Pyramid in Giza in 1987. Also, his support of fellow Japanese Egyptologist theories that their shared polytheistic histories and the similarities between Japanese kanji and Egyptian hieroglyphs means Japanese archaeologists can bring a different sensibility to the study of the region than Western researchers. Do even a tiny bit of digging into the history of Japanese ancient Egyptian studies and Tsukuji Yoshimura pops up all over the place. He even appeared in Ankh Tutankhamun no Natso, a full motion video game based in Egypt for the PlayStation and Saturn in 1997. One of the first three discs out of the gate for the Pioneer Laser Active being an edutainment title falls right in line with the focus on such software for optical media that I covered in my original Laser Active video. But what makes the Great Period a Laser Active disc? How is it any different from a standard educational disc you might buy or watch in school on a standard Laserdisc player? There are three features that the integrated Genesis hardware brings to the party. First of all are the interactive menus. While standard Laserdisc players allow you to jog around, hop from chapter to chapter, and jump to specific frames, they don't allow for interactive menus that can appear over the video and direct you to other areas of the experience. The second is the Kiops Boat minigame. There is an unlockable bit of video on the Great Pyramid that discusses a full-sized wooden ship that was discovered sealed in a room at the foot of the Great Pyramid. Unlocking this clip requires you to go on a scavenger hunt. There are eight question mark icons hidden throughout the rest of the footage in the disc. If you find and interact with all eight, you unlock the hidden clip. Unfortunately, your progress isn't saved from one play session to the next, so you have to do it all in one sitting. But the most important thing that the Laser Active format brings to the party as far as I'm concerned are these little icons you'll find scattered throughout the viewing experience. They're essentially hyperlinks, which allow you to jump to associated footage based on the current theme, or continue watching a series of videos further explaining the current subject. This kind of functionality seems pretty run-of-the-mill in 2021, for obvious reasons, but it was sidestepping a major drawback to the Laserdisc format back in 1993. As I spoke about in the Laser Active episode of Generation 16, Laserdisc wasn't sold merely as a means to watch movies at home. There was a large push for industrial use, such as in-store kiosks with searchable catalogs, training videos, and for educational purposes. Reference discs were a big thing on Laserdisc right from the word go. Most of us who are old enough to have gone to high school in the 90s might remember the transition from researching papers using a traditional bound set of encyclopedias to digital encyclopedias on CD-ROM like Encarta or Compton. In fact, encyclopedias on CD-ROM are what ultimately killed the lucrative encyclopedia market, more so than the evolution of the internet. But before there were encyclopedias on CD-ROM, there was an encyclopedia on Laserdisc. In the early 80s, Dutch company Aret decided it wanted to compete with the almighty Britannica and World Book Encyclopedias by offering to put its information in online databases such as CompuServe and the Dow Jones News Service. I don't think it really put a dent in its competitors' markets, but it was a start. In 1985, Groliers, having purchased Aret, took another step toward the obsolescence of paper encyclopedias by releasing the Knowledge Disk, which was literally a full set of encyclopedias you could sift through using the step command on your Laserdisc player. The advantages were obvious. Here on a single 12-inch Laserdisc, you could find all of the knowledge otherwise stored in over 50 pounds worth of books, while a full set of encyclopedias would cost you over $650, which is about $1,600 in 2021, and a full bookshelf or two in your home, you could pick up the knowledge disc for a paltry $89.99. Even buying the disc and the player itself was cheaper than owning a full set of Grolier's books. But the downsides were evident right from the start as well. While it was fully possible to include pictures and reference video in the Laserdisc format, the first Grolier knowledge disc didn't include either within its 32,000 articles. And while jumping from page to page was as simple as checking the table of contents and keying in the proper frame reference, it was still a linear experience that featured no menu system, search engine, or cross-referencing ability. This was such an obvious shortcoming that even in 1985, Grolier Electronic Publishing Vice President Frank J. Farrell was upselling consumers to the impending CD-ROM version of the encyclopedia 
write-in reviews of the knowledge disk, citing its ability to make discovery painless. With our CD-ROM encyclopedia, you'll easily find dozens of references to a topic instead of just the obvious three or four. If, say, you wanted to research German subs, you'll also be pointed to unexpected references like Ernest Hemingway, who spent two years hunting German subs on his private yacht. If you're interested in Oedipus, you'll come up with 34 references, including Thomas Hardy, who used the Oedipus theme for his first critically acclaimed novel. Ultimately, Britannica beat Grolier to the CD-ROM market with its Compton brand, which we'll be covering on the Sega CD in a future episode of Generation 16. But inasmuch as digital encyclopedias killed the physical book form, it looks like it basically took out the Laserdisc version as well. Educational Laserdiscs continued to be a thing well into the 90s, but tended to hold on to the multimedia formats seen early on in products like the First National Kid Disc and How to Watch Pro Football. For example, this channel read disc features a mystery that students can solve just by watching each chapter. Reference and support are found by jumping to specific chapters whenever the video pauses automatically. This is still a linear experience, but features something akin to branching paths which are easy to navigate by limiting the viewer's choices and only offering them at specific points in time. Getting back to the Great Pyramid, these jump icons, as they're called right on the disc sleeve, are an attempt to fix some of the inherent issues within the Laserdisc format. The jump icons come in a few different varieties. For example, tapping a button while this reference icon is in the upper right corner jumps from this segment about the boy king Tutankhamun to show a short clip about the famous discovery of his tomb. Once the new clip is finished, the user is taken back to the first segment and it picks up where it previously left off. When this little pyramid icon appears on the bottom right corner, using it is akin to selecting See More at the end of the current video. Do nothing and you'll return to the menu. Click the icon and you'll move on to the next clip in a sequence on the same subject. At one point, the pyramid icon will take the user to an interactive map of the Great Pyramid at Giza, where you can access the videos about each discovered chamber. The mystery and god icons that will appear in the bottom right at certain points essentially do the same thing. I'm not totally sure why they're differentiated at all. The end result is an experience that feels far less passive than your standard Laserdisc full of reference material, and jumping from one related subject to another doesn't require looking up a table of contents and typing in a chapter or frame identifier with a number pad. But this level of interactivity also makes the experience feel pretty disorganized. You get this feeling like you might be missing something, and it's hard to remember how to find your way back to a particular clip if you might be looking for a very specific bit of information. Plus, you spend the entire time hovering over your controller, since you have a very small window in which to interact with an icon when it appears on screen unannounced. As a launch title for the Laser Active, the Great Pyramid makes a lot of sense. Like I've said, educational content was a big branch of software marketing in the early 90s, so this ticked the box on the Laser Active's launch day, hopefully guaranteeing that more discerning consumers would take the device a bit more seriously. Ultimately though, the Great Pyramid ended up being one of only two educational titles released for the system. And that's it for this episode of Generation 16. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, please like, share, and subscribe, and please consider supporting the show on Patreon. Join me next time as I continue my trip through the Pioneer Laser Active Library when I review the third and final launch game for the system, I Will, The Story of London. See you then.